digital economist from the World Economic Forum here in Davos, Switzerland. We are holding our inaugural round table and we're very excited to have a huge turnover and a highly curated round table. platform focused on thought leadership and bringing investable opportunities in alignment with the sustainable development goals to the fore. So we're very excited to welcome uh, folks on January 23rd this evening and uh, looking forward to a great partnership and a lot of value we create for the community along the way. So welcome. Frank Ugerichter is the chairperson of Harasses, uh, which is a global visions community, and uh, just building a fantastic global community from over the past more than 15 years. Frank, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so we're very, very, very excited to have him uh, today. And he's going to be talking a little bit about his story, which I've never learned. So all of you would get uh, an inside scoop along uh, along with me for the first time, uh, but also his take on the geopolitics in the world uh, in, a, in a very timely and I think a very uncertain world, uh, perhaps even chaotic, um, and uh, what Harassus does and, and how you can engage. So uh, with that, uh, Frank, I'd love to invite you to just talk a little bit about yourself, um, just a couple of minutes, and then we'll just uh, dive right in. Thanks so much, uh, Nathrup. And, uh, you know, I have uh, great memories when we met last year in a small uh, Swiss restaurant in the snow and nobody would have thought what's happening. Um, and, uh, you know, we always talk about uh, risk and predictions and scenarios, but I guess nobody uh, really predicted what's happening right now. And it's not just the health crisis, it's really a global crisis, it's a social crisis, it's an economic crisis. Let me also say um, from the onset, uh, Navrup, what you're doing is amazing. Uh, the digital economist, um, your baby and your inspiration. And, uh, you know, everybody talks about uh, the new industrial revolution or the fourth industrial revolution. But I think we talk too much about uh, the machines, about um, AI, about um, anything digital, but not about uh, the human touch to it. And I would um, actually rather talk about uh, the fifth industrial revolution, where we really combine um, our minds to the machines. But uh, let me just say um, a few words um, to start this discussion. And um, as, uh, it's a fireside chat tonight, and I hope you have a lot of questions yourself, Narub, and take a lot of uh, questions from the audience. And let me start my introduction by saying that the current state of the world is quite gloomy. Whenever, you know, you read the news in the morning, you know, re you read bad news, you read about um, people dying, um, losing their loved ones, uh, about people losing their jobs, about um, even insurrection and people uh, storming the hill. Uh, and not only in the US, actually, all around the world, we feel um, social unrest. And the question is, uh, and we will um, go into it in the more detail, um, are we entering uh, a new area of depression, uh, of chaos, of revolution, or are we entering potentially um, something like the new roaring 20s, um, uh, a time of renaissance after all what happened last year and opening and um, taking this crisis uh, as an opportunity. And, you know, there, there are reasons for um, both uh, scenarios to happen and to believe in. Um, and most people might say, you know, uh, we are first going into um, uh, a deep crisis and uh, it might be um, not only a recession, but um, um, a depression similar to what we experienced um, during the last uh, big depression, you know, when uh, a lot of people lost their jobs and uh, finally actually even entering uh, a war, you know, the Second World War happened right after the depression because people 
looked for solutions. And sometimes, you know, solutions are very populist and, uh, and easy to take. You can just uh, point your finger. Uh, and uh, that's actually uh, a big concern that uh, nowadays, you know, we, we read the news, uh, we get informed, uh, we are on social media, but we don't really know what is true and what is not true. And everybody, um, you know, in the higher echelons usually says, you know, we uh, provide the truth. We are the truth. We are the ones, you know, uh, to, to lead. But um, who can tell us, you know, that those people are the right people or the wrong people? So a lot of questions, uh, a lot of doubts, uh, a lot of uncertainty. And um, I would say, you know, in times of uncertainty, there's great opportunity. And um, what we do at Horasis, we look into opportunities. We look into the grand visions for the future. We invite the world's um, major stakeholder from business, government, but also civil society to jointly find solutions. And to use um, this time of COVID crisis and the pandemic um, to re-envision the world. And it's not just um, a reset. You know, a lot of people talk about uh, the grand reset, uh, which I think is totally wrong. A reset is something, you know, like a cold start of your computer, right? You, um, you know, in the evening, you kind of close it down and then um, uh, you go for a reset. But um, uh, I think um, we can't really go back uh, to the good old days. We just can't go for a, um, a simple reset. What we really need um, is to um, redesign the world, uh, to inspire the world, to find new solutions, how we can all work together, and um, how also we can you know, um, lead this world um, to like um, uh, the new, uh, new hope or renaissance, um, uh, going actually beyond uh, the view of pandemics, you know, issues like climate change, for example, which are maybe even more threatening than the pandemic itself, or the geopolitical uh, setting in the world. You know, we, uh, we are talking a lot about uh, missiles in space, you know, Russia and uh, the US, but also China. And if we should go for a new agreement, uh, President Trump uh, unilaterally uh, canceled the agreement um, President Biden and, you know, all the kudos to him after only one week or 10 days in office, um, he is re re renegotiating the deal with the Russians. The question is, you know, on the long term, if it's enough or is a, a new um, arm race between uh, both nations or between the three nations, China actually is a new rising power. Uh, talking about China, um, you know, um, I see uh, a lot of potential um skirmishes, uh, uh, even like hostilities and, and even outright war between US and China, because, you know, we have one country uh, leading the world, it's the US, and um, uh, the power of US is kind of stable, but um, potentially waning and uh, decreasing, because there's a big challenge, it's China, it's not Russia, it's China, China got all the economic might and power. China got the, the tech power. Nowadays, China actually is leading uh, in e-commerce, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, even in blockchain. President Xi Jinping himself um, you know, uh, said uh, China has to jump on the bandwagon and uh, has to be a leader in blockchain. And uh, it's quite amazing you know, how this country uh, is moving ahead and taking the economic and the technological lead. And um, I would say the, the current um, uh, trade war between the US and China is leading into a tech war. And uh, the tech war might re really uh, lead into first a cyber war and uh, finally into a real war, you know, like a standoff between both countries. But, you know, um, I just put a few um, pointers out here and uh, talking about, you know, risk um, out there and um, talking about um, potential threats, um, I think, you know, as humans, we have to be optimist and we have to come together and um, fix the system and um, reinvent the system using this crisis as an opportunity. You know, uh, and you're an economist, Navrop, um, uh, you know, the, the famous uh, American-Austrian economist, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who said we need um, uh, destruction. We need actually a creative destruction uh, to be able to rebuild. And maybe 
the current crisis is even uh, a blessing in disguise, and uh, it might sound presumptuous, but uh, you know, in crisis, uh, we have the opportunity to to rebuild and um, to do something new and uh, to really advance human mankind. Uh, maybe let me stop here um, uh, right, for right. some first thoughts and. Um, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, um, we can continue on that and what it really means uh, for entrepreneurs and, and for ordinary citizens. Mm -hmm. I never waste a good crisis, they say. So uh, spot on, Frank. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I guess a quick um, quick precursor into the, the, the wide breadth and the range of topics that we'll be covering in this session. Um, and Frank, you talk um, you know, frequently on some of the highest platforms in the world around a lot of these issues, particularly now with the pandemic. But what I really want to do before we kind of go deeper into some of those uh, geopolitical economic uh, discussions and related to the pandemic is, is give the audience a little bit scoop into who you are and how you ended up building what you have built. Um, so take us, take us back. So, so you, were, uh, you are from Switzerland. Let's start there. Right. Yeah. You know, it's sometimes uh, actually easier to talk about geopolitics than uh, speaking about yourself. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's change easier. that today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But, you know, um, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe just um, uh, a few things. Um, I um, um, was born in Germany um, and um, I, I was living actually in Germany until um, uh, 18, 19 years old. And I was quite a protected child, uh, you know, um, usually uh, spending a lot of time at home and reading. So I was quite addicted, you know, when everybody else went to uh, the parties and uh, uh, discovered, you know, uh, the fancy restaurants and so on, and uh, the dance floor eventually, I, I uh, preferred to stay at home and, and to read my books. And uh, by hindsight, um, you know, now um, I have to say it was, it was great, you know, because I read um, some of the um, greatest um, singers at the time. You know, I started to read... Um, some of the classics at the age of 14 and 15 gives me a lot of um, inspiration. Um, and um, later on, actually, you know, I, uh, I think at the age of, it was earlier on the age of 12, um, I started to read um, books about um, travel and about uh, people discovering new continents. And um, I felt, you know, um, that's something I want to do as well. And um, uh, first, you know, in my dreams, in my imagination, but later on, actually, um, I said, uh, now it's, uh, uh, it's time to leave my kind of secluded uh, home and protected home and to discover the world. And um, yeah, from the age of 20, I was traveling uh, a bit like crazy. I uh, studied in many different uh, countries, uh, first in Germany, you know, uh, to start with, then um, in Mexico. Uh, and this was quite uh, an opening for me, you know, first time really far away and uh, studying using a different language, uh, working at the same time and traveling. Um, and then um, I went to France for one year, um, again, you know, studying in, in France, um, um, actually uh, both mechanical engineering and business administration. I had um, two degrees. And I did there both at the oh, same time. Oh, that's an time. interesting combination, Frank. Uh, I've never heard of uh, mechanical engineering and business together. What's the overlap and intersection of the two? Just as a quick segue there. Right. You know, in, in Germany, most people actually um, are engineers. It's an engineering culture. And uh, um, engineers or lawyers, uh, not so much business. You know, there's no real like MBA um, uh, education in Germany. Uh, but I wanted to combine both. I wanted to understand both worlds. And um, it helped me a lot later on, you know, when I had my first job. You know, I um, worked basically in, in the business department uh, doing strategic planning and um, working on M&A, on financing, on joint ventures. But to understand the engineers, you know, who develop uh, the products uh, helped a lot. Um, and I wouldn't miss it. Um, yeah, coming back to the studies, um, um, I um, finished my studies at a quite early age, and um, then I decided, you know, um, why should I start to work? I'm too young for that. And um, I uh, went to Japan to do my PhD studies in, in Japan. I went there with um, a, a scholarship of the, um, the German um, Foreign Service. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, two um, eye-opening uh, years for me, um, living actually uh, in a very small apartment. Uh, you know, in Japan, everything is small. And um, uh, everything is expensive. So I lived basically on um, 
four and a half tatami, the count in tatami in Japan, which is around um, seven square meters. So you can see, maybe you can't see now because I'm sitting, I'm a tall guy, uh, and uh, seven square meters, uh, so quite a challenge. So basically there's no bed inside and you have to roll up your tatami every night. Uh, but this was um, uh, a fantastic um, experience. I um, uh, learned Japanese, so I studied Japanese for one year. I did my PhD research. And then um, going home, um, I uh, decided not just to take uh, a plane, but um, to travel. So I traveled basically for almost half a year um, on, a, on a shoestring um, uh, through Asia, uh, first into Southeast Asia, then into China. I spent quite some time in China. Um, and then I um, crossed over to the um, Himalaya, into India, um, and Pakistan, and uh, then flying back. So this um, yeah, was maybe, you know, uh, one of the other um, great experiences of my life. You know, I uh, had only $10 to spend per day, including food, travel, uh, and accommodation. So really not much. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would actually um, always recommend to young people to do the same thing, you know, just taking a challenge and uh, not listening to the parents, but just do what you want to do and uh, realize your dreams, if it's travel or something else. Um, and, uh, yeah, maybe um, I stop here on my, you know, um, younger years and my, my journey, just to say that, you know, I started to work later on and I um, briefly, I went to China for a, a few years. So um, after this trip to China, you know, coming from Japan, I uh, have seen the origin of the Japanese culture, and uh, I was fascinated by the Chinese culture. And um, so I, I decided to uh, learn Mandarin and um, to, um, yeah, to work in China. And I lived for four years in uh, Beijing, uh, working for uh, a multinational. And um, then uh, changing careers, uh, I actually uh, was invited to work for the World Economic Forum. Um, and uh, yeah, everything is, is kind of a legacy. Um, after uh, a few years at the forum, um, uh, I, um, I left uh, to become an entrepreneur. And uh, I think I found my real destiny, uh, you know, not to be employed, but just uh, do my own thing. And uh, I really enjoy it. And I wonder, you know, a lot of uh, a kind of a typical profile. And of course, man is a very loaded statement there. Um, you know, a typical profile of what ends up becoming a, a Daoist man. I, I wonder if we kind of have touched upon and <laughs> right, <laughs> some right. of that here. Yeah, you know, you, you got me. Usually, you know, I'm not talking about Davos because, you know, it's my former employer. But of course, I can talk about the Davos man, <laughs> which is something different. Uh, and you, you, told, you know, you said it already. It's a Davos man. It's not a Davos woman. So the typical Davos man is in his, um, I would say, um, early 60s, uh, white um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, female, maybe just like 5%, right? It's the, the typical, um, um, uh, the typical um, in a way, member profile. Um, and uh, the forum is uh, trying hard to... Um, invite more women uh, to join. And I think uh, rightly uh, doing so, but um, not very successfully as yet. I think only now it's like 15% uh, regular female participants, not, you know, people coming uh, as spouses. But it's it's not actually reflecting the problem of doubles, but uh, the problem um, in this world, right? Because uh, women are still underprivileged and um, are not in positions of power. If you think about uh, the number of female um, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies in the US, there may be like um, less than 5%, um, which is really a shame. And, uh, you know, I'm um, a staunch um, proponent of um, including or having um, a quota, uh, at least on the boards, on the uh, supervisory boards of large listed companies saying that 50% of um, the uh, board members have to be female. Um, some countries um, started this, especially the Nordic countries like Norway and, uh, and Sweden and Denmark. Now Germany is um, uh, starting as well. And I think it's, it's the right thing to do. And maybe the next step should be that even on the management board, we should have more, um, more female executives. But coming back to the question, uh, what, does, um, what, what is a Davos man or a Davos woman? We talk a lot about uh, globalization, and uh, that's a bit the the kind of um, enigma of of, of Davos, uh, saying that you know Davos stands for a free and open world, the open society, and and capitalism. 
uh, of course, you know, 80% of participants there, or even 9%, are representatives of large companies. So it's all about uh, capitalism. Even so, we talk about, you know, the, the big picture and how to improve things in this world. Uh, but I think we have to um, reposition capitalism to make it more social and uh, to make it more uh, inclusive. And um, I think we have to also repaint uh, the image of the Davos men and uh, to make the Davos men more with more, you know, um, with more sympathy. And um, uh, I think, you know, uh, we, we would love, we would all like to, to like the Davos men and, and not hate him uh, for what he is doing. And, uh, you know, the image of um, the capitalist just going um, to a meeting uh, and, and, you know, for the deal making, it's not um, the image we need these days. We need... Um, to educate um, the, our leaders to really engage in society, to give back to society, and to also install a purpose in their companies. I think purpose is really what counts. It's no longer just um, shareholder value, you know, where you um, try to increase um, your returns, uh, your uh, the shareholder value and, and the stock price. Uh, and it's always very short-term oriented. What really counts in our work these days is, is, is purpose. Uh, a company should really uh, live uh, or be a living example of, of the good things they can do. And purpose should be uh, part of the DNA of each company. Uh, it shouldn't be an add-on like you know corporate social responsibility or a bit philanthropy. It should really be at the core of, uh, of a company. You know, I had a uh, talk recently with the CEO of uh, Danone, the, the famous uh, French uh, dairy company, uh, Emmanuel Faber. And um, the CEO of Danone, um, you know, from, from his position as a CEO, he installed uh, purpose as uh, the main uh, guideline, the main mission of, of the company. So whatever, you know, employees do every day, every minute, they should think about the purpose, you know, to, to bring uh, or to, how to improve the global public goods, how to um, improve the quality of uh, their products and their services and not to do harm to the environment. And it's really, you know, um, part, it's really entrenched in the culture and it's really visible. And uh, that's a good example, you know, how uh, companies um, should behave, how companies should be a good, good role model and how they should kind of redefine the image of the Davos men. Right, right. So that's so fascinating, Frank. Uh, I wonder if there should be... Um some sort of way to creatively repaint that picture. You you said it, and I, I almost had a visual as you were talking. I thought, well, what if there is uh, a canvas we make and 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 we redefine, re 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 I'm sorry, um, what that persona should look like. Uh, and I think uh, I have a fairly good visual <laughs> sense of it, uh, but but we'll but we'll reserve that for later. Um, so Frank, all the experiences, so you always had to drive to uh, push outward and explore the world um, and travel to um, different parts of the world and all of those um, activities that, you know, I, I remember you once mentioned and, and, and I'll kind of mention why I'm asking this question uh, because on one of the emails you said to me, I travel, I'm on a flight almost every day. And I thought to myself, my God, I've never, <laughs> I've never heard or met anyone who's on a flight every single day, uh, right? Carbon footprint aside, Frank. So uh, no worries on that uh, for for this session. But um, you know, how is all all of that sort of feeding? Into, I'm so curious to learn um, into what you ended up building in Harasses, and I think there's there's clearly a a focus on Asia as well, both from your travels and, and I believe what Taras is, uh, is currently pursuing too. Right, you know, the travel is not just, you know, um, um, for the travel and, and for the excitement. Uh, the travel, of course, is always business related, you know, meeting um, governments and, and business leaders. Uh, by the way, you know, uh, looking back, I think uh, it was horrible what I did, you know, think about the carbon footprint. Nowadays, we can just hop on a Zoom call and um, meet almost everybody. Actually, recently, I had a, a Zoom call with uh, a head of state uh, of a very large country, with uh, the president of Nigeria. Um, so we had a half an hour Zoom call and um, straight in his cabinet office, uh, he was sitting with two ministers to his left and two ministers of his right. And, uh, you know, there's no need to travel anymore. You can just meet over Zoom. 
But um, of course, you know, you can only do that um, once you have a reputation and uh, otherwise people won't invite you for a Zoom call. Only if you know people beforehand, it's not automatic. And, uh, you know, what always um, fascinated me when I traveled and I discovered the world was uh, to discover the culture and the cultural differences and uh, basically to, to overcome those differences. It's actually at the very core uh, of what you do at Harasis. You want to bring people of different cultures, different industries, uh, different, um, um, even different groups of societies uh, together and uh, to be maybe even a bit controversial and uh, but try to find common ground. Um, I remember once um, at a meeting we hosted in the uh, United Emirates, we had a panel with a minister from India and a minister from Pakistan. Uh, just the two, uh, plus myself as a moderator. Um, and um, this was uh, quite something, you know, because usually um, uh, representatives uh, of countries which are not on very good terms don't sit together. But uh, we did a lot of uh, backdoor diplomacy that it's important. Um, and it worked perfectly well. And um, after the panel, uh, it was a very friendly discussion. Um, both ministers said, oh, you know, we have many more commonalities than, than differences. And uh, that's something we want to do, you know, bringing people together. And um, um, I wouldn't say, you know, we are engaged in the peace process um, as such. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, we, we are trying to make our small contribution to it. But, um, you know, a small contribution helps. Um, I think, you know, when you understand um, somebody better, a different culture, a different political system, and we avoid uh, the finger pointing. Maybe you heard of... Um, the famous um, Italian philosopher Machiavelli, who basically said, uh, the end justifies the means. And that's basically the principle in power politics. You know, people always find uh, a culprit, somebody, you know, who says, or who, who did something, um, uh, which, um, you know, you take um, as an advantage to defend yourself. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's it always happened in, in, in politics and people always try to find a reason uh, for maybe attacking a country or attacking a person. Uh, and that's how usually uh, a war is, is starting, right? Uh, sometimes even countries pretend that something is happening and take it for a reason uh, to invade uh, the other country. So how can we prevent this? And uh, I want just to give you um, in the two minutes a bit of um, philosophical or theoretical um, background um, on that. I'm a, a staunch believer in altruism. Uh, altruism basically meaning that we have to um, love each other or we have to support each other um, and uh, have to give the other person instead of just taking. And um, of course, it can't be um, a full altruism if, if we give everything. Let's say if we give away our clothes in winter, we will die, right? Because it's, it's pretty cold outside, at least in Europe. Uh, but um, what I'm talking about is a concept I call weak altruism where we give um, as much as we can. We can still survive. Of course, we have to protect ourselves, but we support the others. And um, it's not uh, that we get any benefit on the short term, but we will get a benefit on the long term because the whole system is growing. The whole system uh, is having a benefit, you know, when we are altruist. And then, you know, on the long term, we are getting uh, an advantage and, uh, you know, somehow um, uh, a benefit out of it. The just imagine now, but if everybody would follow the principle of uh, weak altruism, there wouldn't be any war, there wouldn't be any conflict, uh, there wouldn't be any um, divide, like a digital divide or a social or cultural divide. Uh, it would be almost like paradise. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's maybe utopia, <laughs> but uh, I think we have to dream big, you know, to, to, to advance. And what we do at Horasis, in a way, um, is a small contribution to that. You know, we bring people together, you know, from, from all the different walks of life. We also invite a lot of young people. We invite um, elder statesmen and we mix. You know, we try to have um, very diverse panels. Um, and I think that's, that's really um, uh, the key, you know, uh, this, to find the right mix and, and to get a group of people together to, to build a community, finally, which uh, is joining hands uh, and um, trying to uh, save Mother Earth and to advance human mankind.
The, the U.S. summit uh, for us is, is coming up in, in March. And you mentioned one thing, um, and of course, there are many gems there and many, uh, many different, um, uh, you know, philosophies and, and uh, uh, other things we can kind of get into. I was thinking about the ancient Indian sort of, you know, obviously concept of karma and, uh, and how uh, Greek stoicism is not too far away from uh, what you talk about as um uh, weak altruism, but um, you mentioned something about um, countries sort of uh, making things up many times just to kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, act in an aggressive way against other countries. I, I remember reading this quote when I was in high school, uh, which said uh, the U.S., uh, talking about the U.S. in particular, uh, picks up one uh, crappy country, it said, uh, every few years and, and smashes it against the wall just to indicate to the world that we mean business. And now, of course, we can argue a lot of that has eroded away in terms of the hegemony of the U.S. over the past four years. But, um, you know, what is your take on um, that sort of attitude? Of course, a lot of it is, you know, triggered by resource wars, right? Economics can explain a lot of um, throughout millennia, really, uh, you know, a lot of these acts at, at, at a national level. So the two things I'm thinking about, kind of a secondary question to that is communities like Harasses or to, you know, a great degree VEF uh, over, the, over the years is um, getting people and individuals together. But individuals and countries act differently, right? And countries, of course, act in a lot more selfish and self-centered, protecting the national interest, that sort of way on on, on, on international sort of um, uh, space or arena. So how do we kind of take this investment, if you may, in the individual and translate that to how nations can do better? Right. You know, um, we have to define, of course, what um, the collective um, image is of people. If it's like a nation, if it's um, uh, maybe a group of people who have the same um, system of beliefs or the same religion, um, what really, you know, what are the communities around us and um, how can we uh, nurture them? And, uh, you know, one thing, one thought I want to start with is uh, if we have a community, it's good for the people inside the community, but it's bad for the people outside. Um, think about, you know, all the, the trade agreements, the European Union, for example, right? It's it's great to be a member of the European Union. Even, you know, our British friends just left it. Um, but um, uh, I think it's, it's one of the um, greatest uh, achievements in European history to bring the countries together. But it's not good for those outside uh, the country uh, who, who can't get in into like a closed uh, shop, right? Or to, to, to be part uh, of this community. Um, and ideally, you know, I would like to see a, a world community where everybody is involved and uh, uh, without, uh, you know, having to take account uh, where the person is coming from, if it's a young person, old person, uh, a different political system, but just having one global system and, and no hatred is, is existing. Um, and, you know, in this sense, I'm quite... Um, uh, uh, a strong supporter of multilateral thinking. I'm a fan of the United Nations. Even so, uh, a lot of people say that the UN is very uh, bureaucratic um, and uh, it's very expensive and there's not much result. Um, I would say it's the opposite. You know, the UN um, is always uh, a guiding uh, organization to what's happening uh, in the world, uh, given also the moral kind of consciousness of what we are doing. Uh, you know, when Antonio Guterres um, is standing up and uh, says, you know, climate change is uh, is a main threat uh, to human mankind, I think, you know, everybody is taking him serious. By the way, um, Antonio Guterres attended our last meeting. Um, this was our um, extraordinary meeting on the 1st of October, and um, he attended um, and he talked to us. And um, like him, we invited a few other uh, representatives of um, international organizations. So in the future, you know, we need more multilateral thinking, not less. We need to um, 
uh, give away and go beyond uh, uh, populism and nationalism. The concept of somebody saying, you know, I'm American, I'm Indian, I'm German, I think it's over. Um, maybe if it comes to football or to soccer or uh, to any sports, we, we st of course, we cheer for our team. But beyond that, you know, we are all world citizens, right? It doesn't really matter uh, if we are like uh, from country A, B or C. Uh, and, but are um, we, um, Frank, are we? When we say, I think there is, so I think an example, personally, I'm on my seventh American visa and uh, <laughs> okay. um, with, with, an, with an Indian passport, right? So every time I have to travel to Switzerland, um, I have to get another Schengen visa because it's only for a year at most, you know, with all the privileges of, uh, of you know, uh, background and where, where I happen to be now, so on and so forth. So, um, you know, the world is increasingly unequal. Uh, in the U.S. itself, we are back to pre-World War II levels of inequality, right? And so this is what data is telling us. Thomas Piketty, as you know, in uh, a very famous French economist, uh, wrote this uh, kind of gigantic book on um, capitalism in the 21st century, right? Talking about capitalism and, and Davos and, and, the, um, and the agenda of WEF. Um, so how are we, uh, I guess, readjusting that vision to a world which is going the opposite direction really and then the other thing there is that a lot of the wealth that got accumulated right over the past let's say 50 years is now being transferred to the next generation and more than 80 percent of the wealth anyway comes down from your you know parents and grandparents and things like that now that is even more problematic because a you haven't earned it and b the attitude is to preserve it rather than invest that and you know grow it or that sort of thing kind of like the entrepreneurial mindset right um and so i mean i wonder the so when i was in high school you know um i used to write these un exams and even i remember in middle school um, and a lot of what you just said, Frank, and this is, I'm kind of playing the devil's advocate here. Uh, we were discussing at the time, the worth of the UN, multilateralism, but, you know, over the past years, just again, speaking as an economist, when we look at the macro economy, when we look at the numbers, it's, it's very concerning. And the wealth transfer is not complete yet. It's, it's still in the work. And, you know, this, inequality unless something drastically changes uh and and we have a, a lot of our folks from our um uh, you know uh, WEF meetings in davos I, I i see the names here a lot of our friends and uh you know david here is saying you're very optimistic and i think my comment is kind of similar to that how do we readjust that how do we grapple with the reality that we are going to be living in an even more unequal world 10 20 years down the line yeah. How do we you know, fix um, it? Yeah, you, you said it now, Rob. It's it's a reality. Um, you know, the, the divide is um, growing. There's a lot of um, inequality. And it's not just um, um, comparing countries like a rich country like U.S. or a poor country somewhere in, in Latin America, Africa, or in, in Asia. It's also uh, within countries. You know, when last time I went to um, San Francisco, um, I was actually uh, shocked. You know, I went to the Silicon Valley and... Um, I spent also um, half a day in, in San Francisco itself and see so a lot of, lot of people actually um, sleeping on the streets of San Francisco uh, and having no shelter. And um, I was really shocked to see that. And, you know, it's one of the uh, wealthiest, richest um, cities on, on earth. Um, so we see it everywhere. And uh, this is a lot of potential, actually, um, for disruption and even revolution. And, um, you know, uh, the revolution could come from the left or from the right, or maybe both combined together. And, um, you know, uh, and we see it all around the world. Think about what happened in Paris two years ago, the so-called um, Yellow West movement, uh, where a lot of French citizens uh, went to the street protesting against the elite and saying, you know, uh, you have your party, you have your um, nice um, chalets and houses in Paris and somewhere around on the beach, but um, we live in misery. And that's, you know, one of the most most advanced countries in, in Europe. 
Um, and uh, this year, the West movement um, spilled over actually to, to many other countries, um, even to, to Chile in Latin America, into, into Lebanon, into Thailand. Uh, so we see mass protests all around. Um, and maybe, you know, social media is kind of um, supporting or, you know, uh, advancing all that because we can so easily exchange information. And of course, you know, what's happening in Paris might be copied in Santiago de Chile tomorrow. Uh, the question is, you know, is there really um, a revolution um, in the making? And um, I would say if, if we are not really careful, um, it could happen uh, because, you know, people don't accept the inequality anymore uh, between the haves and the have-nots. Talk about some, you know, very um, traumatic and, and sad and imminent challenge uh, in Europe actually is migration uh, of people coming over the Mediterranean Sea um, from Northern Africa. Uh, risking their life and they want to go for, you know, uh, uh, a better uh, life in Europe. Um, and, uh, you know, the risk, you know, just in a small boat coming over and most, a lot of people are losing their life. Uh, and, but, you know, they're forced to do so because back home, there's no livelihood. There's no way to nourish um, uh, the family. Um, and this is really traumatic. And what Europe is doing now, they're just basically closing the borders. Uh, and, and trying to kind of keep them out. Is this a solution? No. It's maybe a short sighted solution for Europe, but not for, for the world, definitely not for the people who look for shelter. So what we have to do, and I'm just, you know, looking on some of the questions here coming in, um, how can it, what is the plan? How can we implement um, a world um, uh, which is better, you know, a, a world which is uh, bringing up more um, opportunities um, and, um, you know, a world, um, yeah, which we are proud of, of uh, being part of and, and shaping this world. I talked about uh, the two scenarios before now, you know, one is uh, a great depression. One is um, the idea of the roaring 20s. And uh, maybe actually we see, we'll see both. First, um, a recovery um, and uh, really entering something like uh, the roaring 20s with um, a lot of optimism, economic growth after the crisis. Uh, but then uh, maybe after eight to 10 years leading to a big catastrophe again, because, um, you know, we, we didn't learn from history and um, it's all over done. Uh, and, you know, we are not really working on closing the divide. Uh, we are widening it uh, because, you know, uh, the party is starting again, you know, stock exchange is going up. Um, but uh, most people are not really part of this. Um, uh, part of this big, you know, uh, party and, and coming out and uh, the roaring 20s and then leading again to a, to a big crisis. So how can we prevent this and what is the plan? And uh, let's do this a bit of a brainstorming here and maybe some of our participants and, and yourself, of course, you can jump in. But just to give you an idea, you know, it all starts with dialogue. It all starts with um, cultural understanding. It all starts with getting together to build trust. Actually, the uh, rebuilding trust is the theme of our um, upcoming meeting on America, the USA meeting, uh, because, you know, people don't trust institutions anymore. People don't trust governments. People don't trust um, big tech. Uh, people don't trust themselves or, you know, uh, even within families, sometimes there's a divide. And, uh, you know, we see mistrust uh, all around. So I think to come over it, uh, we have to meet uh, we have to um, meet people of different uh, upbringings, uh, of different cultures. Of course, we can't meet physically now. So what you do tonight is a, is a great example of getting people together, uh, spending time and um, exchanging ideas and learning from each other. Uh, and I think this should be institutionalized. Uh, we should have, you know, this kind of dialogue all the time on all levels. And uh, not like in Davos, where we say that, you know, only, you know, Fortune 500 companies, the CEO paying a lot of money can enter. But uh, we should actually have everybody there. You know, we should have civil society. We should have an open exchange. You know, one of my heroes um, as, a, as a young boy, and I told you before I was reading a lot, uh, was uh, Karl Popper, the Austrian philosopher who wrote about the uh, open society. Uh, where, you know, we don't close, we don't build walls, we, 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 we are like an open system, we embrace change, we take, you know, um, influence from the outside. Globalization, actually, for me, in Europe, is something that we can take uh, the best from everybody, from everything, from every country, 
uh, and not just you know one unique or one kind of predominant culture. Uh, Hollywood, you know, for all the uh, admiration I have um, uh, with Hollywood, and you know the movies coming out, Hollywood is kind of dominating uh, our culture. You know, the, the movies coming out there. But, you know, uh, the world is much bigger. You know, there are great movies, great stories um, all around the world. But um, who is uh, in the U.S., for example, who is watching movies coming from France, from Italy, from Spain? They're fantastic, you know, um, directors and, and filmmakers. And who is uh, watching movies from, let's say, um, uh, Iran, uh, China uh, or, or Russia? Or and India. Like, hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. Right. Sorry, I said India because uh, Bollywood makes the most number of movies uh, per year uh, right. by far. You know, it's a multiple of what Hollywood is. Um, yeah, and, and Frank, you know, I think um, in in I guess in our hearts we all um, want to see a better world. Um, and yet we have uh, more more questions pouring in. Please please post your questions in the in the chat um, instead of raising your hand, uh, so I can read that for Frank. But um, but but is it really Frank? Because we live in a system. I mean, Europe is rich uh, and we have privileges. And I'm not part of it. I still hold the Indian passport. <laughs> but um, you know, by exploiting the rest of the world, right and uh, that's, for example, in UK, they don't teach kids about um, the colonial activities of, of, the, of the British Empire, right? And so there's so much um, delusion and washing deliberate uh, ways to uh, project a certain kind of world. And I think that's also something that, that happens, for example, in Africa, where there's aid from other parts of the world and you see on social media there's usually a young um uh, european or american or canadian volunteer will go and sort of take a selfie with all the poor kids in the village and i think there's a term for it a poverty porn or something like that uh, where they want to project to the world that okay we are doing good stuff and and that's right but i think you know, coming from a quote unquote third world country, I would really challenge that because this ability to just, for example, travel the world uh, without having to worry about visas and things like that is a, is a very, you know, is a privilege of a very select small fragment and fraction of the 200 countries in the world. And so it's, you know, it's a certain, um, way of looking at the world that is facilitated by the the power and the privilege that you know uh, many of us are are born with but that's not the reality for you know the, the rest of the world so i think um a lot of what you said is um when we turn that around how would that apply to you know other parts of the world it's easy when you're european to say go travel the world I mean, if you have an Afghani passport, good luck. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, so, so, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts. So I can go on and on about it. So my apologies. I'm getting a little <laughs> carried away. But Frank, take, right. take it away from here. Yeah, you know, my, my, my grand vision and my dream um, is that, you know, we maybe um, will give up um, uh, passports in, in the traditional sense in the future, you know, where we collect stamps and have to apply for visa. But uh, to see that the world is open for everybody, of course, post-COVID, uh, the current restrictions, I understand, right? We have to control in some way. But after that, um, free travel um, should be um, uh, not the, the exception, but the rule for everybody. Um, and um, I think, you know, we really have to change our mindset in Europe and, and in the US and um, uh, let everybody in, you know, uh, because it's all um, enriching. Think about, you know, that um, the US now is restricting the number of Chinese students coming over, the number of student visa, and I think even from India and other countries. And, um, uh, you know, those young people um, used to be the best ambassadors uh, for America because, you know, they might invest in the country like yourself, maybe stay forever, uh, maybe at one point apply for American passport, uh, building bridges. But if you restrict, you know, young kids coming in, then it's not happening anymore. And I think uh, America is, is losing its attraction. And if you think about um, Silicon Valley, uh, that uh, most um, new ventures and unicorn actually are built by, by immigrants. 
uh, by you know young Indians uh, or young Chinese or young Europeans. Um, uh, but you know, just just to tell you an interesting story, um, um, I traveled a lot uh, to Africa in the last uh, two years um, prior to COVID. Actually, I went to uh, thirty five African countries in in two years, and uh, the idea behind this, we want to build also an Africa summit. Um, and um, actually last year, my last trip uh, prior to the COVID closure uh, was to Mali, uh, Burkina Faso uh, and to Niger. Uh, so three countries actually nobody is traveling to or almost nobody. But I tell you to get in those countries is not, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, I've seen what it means uh, to apply for a European visa. Likewise, for me, <laughs> to, to, to get visa to African countries is, is, is troublesome. Uh, it's not easy, and uh, especially you know, when you want to hop from one country to the other. Uh, and um, the, the thing is, you know, that many of those countries apply the same rules. They say, you know, what Europe is doing to me, um, I do to them. Um, and uh, this kind of <clears throat> principle of reciprocity is actually bad. Uh, in everything we do, you know, we talked about altruism before, um, and you know, talk about um, uh, nuclear disarmament and uh, you know, kind of abandoning uh, the nukes. Um, we always say, okay, uh, the Russians have to begin or the Americans have to begin, but we are not taking the first step, right? And uh, because everybody is having the same thought, nobody is starting. So I think we have to trust each other, build um, a system of trust, and go for the first step. Uh, give up a little advantage, and then the other one will do the same thing. Uh, and we don't need um, a huge uh, framework of governance. Uh, we just have to trust each other. And that's, I think, the main principle uh, we have to work on. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and Frank, we have a question here from David Goldsmith. He's asking, um, you, you tied engineering to business and university. And if we tie economics and environment causes together, are they not in conflict? So excellent question. Um, and raising a community from tier one, two, and, or three economies to tier four often are damaging our future. What's your proposition there? Very, very Right, yeah, maybe question. you should uh, let uh, David in if it's possible. I'm not sure. You know, David himself is um, a great um, scenario builder and uh, some, somebody he, who thinks about the future, but also um, shaping the future. Hi, David. Uh, you'll be the first one crashing the party, so welcome. Hi, good to see you, David. <laughs> good to see you too, Frank. Yeah, you know, we just talked about scenarios and, you know, um, answering a question, but maybe we should listen to you because you're the expert uh, and you have to answer yourself. But, um, you know, usually um, we put everybody into a box. You have an economist, we have an engineer, we have a politician, we have a social scientist. And uh, we all come up with different solutions. But I believe to tackle um, the issues, the challenges we see in this world, um, uh, you know, we can't um, um, solve those issues on our own. We have to build um, teams, um, uh, including all these different disciplines. We need an economist, we need engineers, we apply different thinking. And uh, I think, you know, one plus one uh, is not two, it's 11, right? Because when you bring all these different characters, disciplines, and um, experiences together, and uh, then we can really move things. Uh, would you agree, David, or what is your approach? I, I completely agree if we can lay down our flags, if we can toss away our currencies and become a humanity as a whole, we could solve all of these challenges. However, or yet, the challenge is this is not happening. So I'm a timeline thinker. I'm constantly saying, how long will this take? And it's the question becomes, how do you create rapid paradigm shifts not believing that COVID actually did it. It, it isn't the, the shift. So what becomes that next prod? What's that next lever? And so I, I believe in timeline challenges that we're facing, and we have to look, what is the timeline that we're looking at and how would we solve backwards? So our project, the one we're working on, is it's not a space project, but it's called Project Moonhot Foundation. And we are working on improving how we live on Earth for all species, but we're doing it counterintuitively. And I think we need a lot more counterintuitive thinkers to come to, together, use timelines, and then bring in the economists and bring in the, the social cause people and bring in the, uh, the heads of government and industry 
yet it's it's not a hopeful proposition. That's why Frank is extremely optimistic. I believe we can solve it, but it's going to, it's going to require a lot of a lot of rethinking. Right. Yeah. No, I fully agree, and um, I think you know governments um, should start to um, build scenarios. You know. One kind of disadvantage of uh, democracies is the very short time horizon um, usually our leaders are having, you know, usually four years and then, you know, that's re-election. And um, in the last year prior to re-election, not much is happening because everybody is campaigning. So, um, uh, you know, the, the four years basically are two years because the first year is also just, you know, wait and see. And um, there are only maybe two years, you know, for window for change. Um, uh, you know, countries like Singapore, for example, have a much longer time horizon. They have uh, a huge um, scenario unit attached to the government with people from different disciplines uh, doing um, just what you said, uh, David. You know, they're, they're think about the future, they try to uh, find scenarios, um, not only for uh, Singapore itself, but um, for the whole of Asia and the whole world. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's a great example how it could be and why Singapore is so successful. Uh, and it got this um, long term approach. But not only governments should do it, um, also um, businesses. Um, you know, um, we at uh, business schools, um, we learned um, to write down business plans, usually like two or three year business plans. Uh, but I think, you know, um, it's not a right approach anymore, uh, what we learned at business school. Um, I think, you know, companies have to think much more long term, maybe like a 10 year scenario, you know, where the company should be or could be. Um, but then at the same time, being extremely tactical um, and having not like a three years business plan, but maybe a one month business plan and always be very vigilant of what's happening and, and uh, be able to, um, you know, uh, interfere and, and to react. So uh, a very long-term vision on the one hand and a very short-term um, action plan on the other hand, but not no longer the, you know, three years business planning we, we learned at business school. As I said, you know, um, it's about agreeing or disagreeing or maybe find, finding common ground. I think um, nothing is uh, black and white. Of course, there are always people exploiting the system. You know, when you leave in people, um, some might just go for, you know, the social subsidies or even, even commit crime. But, uh, you know, I believe that uh, men and women um, are born um, as, uh, as a good person uh, and not as a bad person. And only a minority is doing bad things. Um, there was this famous um, thought by um, John Locke, uh, um, uh, uh, an English philosopher, who basically said, um, Homo homini lupus, uh, in Latin, man is man's wolf, uh, basically saying that it's in our human nature to be bad and to exploit. I would totally disagree. I think, you know, when we are born, you know, as like a baby, as a kid, we are good people and only uh, the environment makes us what we are. So if you change the environment, if you uh, create the right conditions, uh, then, you know, uh, there won't be much crime around. We can't reduce it to zero. But um, we can, um, you know, do the best, make our best um, to um, um, avoid, you know, people just coming in and um, uh, exploiting the system. Most people who come in, you know, and, and uh, come to a country, sometimes even without papers, right? Uh, you, we had a case, yeah. the case of the Tremas in the U.S. They have become entrepreneurs. They have built companies. They are creative. So let them in yeah. and let them do it. Yeah. Um, again, Frank, thank you so much. I want to take this uh, time to salute really the, the uh, eternal optimist, uh, optimistic person inside of you and relentlessly uh, working to, to make the world uh, a better place. And, um, and for that, uh, including harasses and, and everything you do, um, I just want to um, you know, acknowledge that and, um, and encourage everyone to look beyond uh, beyond just the um, what divides that uh, divides us, but also what actually unites us. So thank you again uh, for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to engaging further in the upcoming harasses. And thank you again, everyone, for joining in. Thanks so much, Franco. It was a great pleasure talking to you.